For this last video on thermal physics, we're going to focus in on the molecular nature of gases and how the molecules interacting with each other and the sides of a container result in a variety of different properties that are interrelated. So today we're going to talk about the gas laws, specifically referring to how the gas laws relate mathematically pressure, temperature, the volume, and the amount of the gas. So to get us started, let's remind ourselves of the assumptions of an ideal gas. Large number of identical molecules, volume is negligible of the molecules themselves, the motion is random, there is an electric field pushing in one way over the other, uh, there is no force between molecules, and all collisions are elastic. I think an easier way to really think about this is think about some common scenarios that a gas would no longer be considered ideal. Um, so if we know when it isn't, we know when it is, or we can at least assume when it is. So it is no longer ideal if the gas is heavily compressed. So if you think of like a CO2 canister, it's heavily compressed. Um, and because of that, the molecules are so close together that it breaks a couple of these assumptions. For one, the volume of the molecules is no longer necessarily negligible because they are so much closer together that the empty space between them is a smaller ratio to the overall volume. Uh, you also are breaking this no forces between molecules because the more you compress them and the closer they get together, the more likely those intermolecular forces are going to start to take hold uh, and cause these relationships to, to not be like a gas and more like a liquid. And that leads us to the other main way that a gas is no longer considered ideal, and that's when it's close to a phase change. So if it's really close to the temperature boundary or pressure level that it would change phase from a gas into a liquid. Um, all the internal energy then is coming from EK, uh, so the kinetic energy, and that that is changing the overall um, way that that gas is functioning. So we want to make sure that we are not compressing the gas and it's not super close to becoming a liquid. But other than that, we're going to assume all gases that we see from here on out are ideal and they're going to hold true with the following relationships that we'll talk about in these gas laws. The first of which being Boyle's law. It's a relationship between volume and pressure. And for each of these, we're going to talk about what the molecules are doing to try to understand how these are related based on the molecules themselves. So if you have a container, uh, that has a gas in it. These molecules are moving in random directions and they are hitting the sides of the container. Um, that is what's giving them pressure. And every time a molecule is hitting the side of the container, it imparts a force on that container. Just like if you threw a ball at the wall, it would impart a force on the wall in that collision as it bounces back. Which means the more collisions there are per second, the higher the pressure is going to be. Um, and if you decrease the volume, now there's less empty space for those molecules to be traveling through. So they are going to be hitting the walls more frequently than they did in the larger space. Um, because there are more walls per area than there was before per volume. Um, so if the volume decreases, the pressure increases because you're having more collisions per second. And it's those collisions that provide the force. It's the force in the given area that provides that pressure, which means that the pressure is inversely related to the volume. This symbol here is proportional to, so the pressure is proportional to one over the volume, which means the volume gets big, pressure gets small and vice versa. So our relationship here, if we graph pressure versus volume, if the volume increases, the pressure decreases, and likewise, if the volume decreases, the pressure increases. So we get that inverse relationship there between pressure and volume. An example of when we see this uh, right now, you are actually going through Boyle's Law when you are breathing. So the way that we breathe is our diaphragm contracts, which increases the volume of our lungs. Um, and if the lungs have a larger volume, it means that their pressure decreases. If inside your lungs is a lower pressure of air than it is outside in atmospheric pressure, it's going to draw air from high pressure to low pressure, which allows you to inhale. If you then relax your diaphragm, which decreases the volume of the lungs, the volume gets smaller, the pressure gets bigger and expels that air. So basically, 
we are breathing by creating a temp or a pressure differential using a change in volume. So all that's happening is the diaphragm is just changing the volume of our lungs and the rest is just physics is going in and out based on the, the pressure of that gas. The pressure law then is the relationship between temperature and pressure. So if the temperature increases, we're going to want to know how that changes the pressure. Imagine again, if you will, that we have a container here. In the container are molecules of this ideal gas that are moving at random uh, motion. And every time they hit the wall, they impart a force on that wall. Um, we saw in the last example that the more collisions per second, the, the higher the pressure became. Another way that you could increase the force rather than just having it in hit more times is you could increase how fast you're hitting it. If you tried to create a force on a wall by throwing a ball at it and you threw it twice as fast, it's going to hit with a higher force than it did initially. So if you increase the temperature, you are increasing the kinetic energy of these molecules, which increases their velocity. So a higher temperature means the molecules are moving faster. If they're moving faster when they hit the walls, they are going to impart more force, which imparts a higher pressure on those walls. So we say that the pressure is proportional to the temperature. This is a direct relationship. The hotter it is, the higher the pressure. And we see that if we take measurements over a variety of different temperatures, we see that as the temperature increases, the pressure increases as well. Now, this graph here starts at about 200 degrees Kelvin because that's about as low of a temperature as we're going to get an ideal gas to actually operate. Below that, we're getting too close to a phase change um, that is starting to convert potentially into a liquid rather than a gas. Um, but if we were able to keep the same properties of an ideal gas and just extend this graph down with a dotted line because that doesn't that isn't actually possible, you'll notice that it hits zero pressure when the temperature is zero. So if we were to extend that slope all the way down past this range that we know is impossible because it's no longer a gas, we hit zero uh, pascals at zero degrees Kelvin, which makes sense if you think about it because zero Kelvin absolute zero is when the molecules aren't moving at all anymore. And if they're not moving at all, they're not going to impart any force on the wall because they're not moving. Um, so there is no pressure if the molecules are motionless and the molecules are motionless if the kinetic energy are, is zero and the temperature is zero Kelvin. An example uh, that we can see this in real life, if you've ever experimented with um, some sort of aerosol can, whether it's hairspray or air freshener, uh, when you spray, the pressure dramatically decreases. It's a high pressure inside the can, but when you spray it, it's released to the atmospheric pressure, which is lower. Um, and because of that, the, the pressure actually going down creates a much lower um, temperature overall. Uh, and you'll feel that it's cold. The spray has this colder feeling, even if the can has been sitting at room temperature for a long time. The change in those properties creates a drop in the temperature. Likewise, a lot of those cans have a warning label on them. Since they're already pressurized, they have a warning label to not exceed a certain temperature because if it exceeded a certain temperature, increasing that temperature would increase the pressure potentially beyond the limits of the can itself and it could explode, which would not be good. So any pressurized container um, you want to keep at the temperature limits that are presented. The final relationship that we're going to look at is temperature and volume. This one, we're going to keep the pressure constant. And it's, it's a little harder to think of how would you keep the pressure constant in this case. Um, one common way to do this is to have a floating piston here. So this container has this piston, which is basically just a cap that can float up and down, um, but it's always the same weight. So it's pushing down with the same force, which means that if uh, the molecules start hitting it harder, it's just going to rise up but keep the same overall pressure because it's pushing down with a, a constant amount. So if we're to increase the temperature, just like we saw before, increasing the temperature increases the velocity of these molecules. And if they're going faster, they hit harder. So if you imagine like a, some sort of ceiling that's falling down on you and trying to keep it from falling down and you're throwing tennis balls up at it and the whole class is doing that, the faster you throw them, the higher that ceiling is going to start to rise. Um, and we see that with molecules as well. If we increase the temperature, um, 
the the volume is going to increase. You're creating a larger space because the the pressure, as it equalizes to the same pressure, uh, does so by increasing the volume. So a higher temperature gives you a higher volume. If you were to graph that again, um, this volume is proportional to temperature. We see that uh, starting where it's an ideal gas, um, we get this increase of temperature, gives you an increase of volume. Again, if we were to trace that down, uh, we would end up essentially coming to zero, um, assuming that these molecules, the volume is negligible uh, according to the volume of the container. If they stop moving, they're not pushing on that piston at all, and it's basically going to come to a rest at the bottom. Um, so there's nothing to push it up and keep it keep it up there. So a uh, temperature of zero Kelvin, absolute zero, is going to give us about zero liters of volume. Looking at a couple of examples of this, um, one of my favorite examples to use with this is a balloon. Um, so if you increase the temperature of a balloon, it gets bigger and likewise it decreases the volume if uh, it's getting colder. Uh, one of my favorite examples is you can make a balloon very hot uh, on a hot plate here with a little water in it that increases the temperature and it, you can actually inflate the balloon that way. Here I'm submerging it in an ice bath which is dramatically decreasing the temperature of the whole system and you see that the volume decreases so much that it actually <laughs> sucks the balloon in and it inflates the balloon on the inside of that flask um, because that's the only way to decrease the volume uh, beyond the shape of the flask itself because the flask isn't going to crumple in on itself. So the balloon just inflates itself using the air pressure from the atmosphere. Um, Another great example of this is if you have liquid nitrogen, you blow up a balloon at room temperature, submerge it in liquid nitrogen, it gets so cold that some of the, the gas actually condenses a little bit, um, so it makes the effect even more dramatic, um, and basically looks like it popped. But if you warm it back up, putting it on a warm-ish table, then you'll see that the balloon reinflates uh, because as it's heating up, the volume gets bigger. So temperature of the air inside, decreases uh, if the volume decreases and vice versa. So looking at these three relationships, pressure is inversely related to the volume, pressure is directly related to the temperature, and volume is directly related to the temperature, we get this relationship. Um, this is known as the ideal gas law, something that you probably remember from your days in chemistry. Um, but this holds all of these relationships together, that if NRT, here we'll define those in a minute, um, were held constant, then increasing the pressure would have to mean a decrease in the volume. And then likewise, since pressure is opposite temperature and volume is opposite temperature, those have to be directly related. If one goes up, the other has to go up as well. So defining these different properties, pressure has a lowercase p. We talked about this before with units of Pascal's volume. Uh, we're going to measure in meters cubed. We'll talk about um, some other units for that as well, but that's just going to be a capital V for us. The amount here is what we're using N as. It's, it's a number, basically, and uh, that number is the number of moles of the molecule. So if you want to know how much oxygen gas is in there, the best way to present that is how many moles of oxygen molecules there are. Um, so we're going to measure the amount N in moles. And then the temperature, capital T, is the absolute temperature. So it looks tempting to plug in any temperature units there. It must be in units of Kelvin because that is the absolute temperature that has a zero point at absolute zero when the molecules stop moving. Um, if we use Celsius, a zero point at water freezing isn't useful to us in terms of the physical nature of these molecules. So we're gonna use Kelvin. There are other units for these as well that we can use. Um, these are going to be the standard ones that we'll use, but sometimes for pressure, we might use ATM, which is atmospheres of pressure. Sometimes for volume, we might use liters. As long as you're consistent on the before and after, usually it's okay. Um, but if you're trying to calculate one unknown, um, try to stick with, with these if you're provided those. Um, one other variable here uh, that shows up, R actually isn't a variable at all. It is a constant. R is known as the gas constant. That's 8.31 uh, 
joules per Kelvin per mole. And we'll see that in use here uh, as well. This all shows up in the IB Physics data booklet. Uh, the ideal gas law, PIVNERT here, uh, shows up in subtopic 3.2, and the gas constant shows up in the list of the constants that you might need uh, throughout the, the class. So let's look at how this works in action. What is the pressure of 23 moles of a gas behaving ideally in a 0.25 cubic meter container at 310 Kelvin? Well, this is really just a plug and chug sort of equation, figuring out what you know. So we're trying to find the pressure. We know that the volume is 0.25 cubic meters. We know that the amount is 23 moles of the gas. R is always 8.31. And the temperature here is already in Kelvin, uh, 310. If it was not in Kelvin, if it was given to you in Celsius, you must convert it into Kelvin or you will not get uh, an answer that is reliable. So plugging these in uh, to the equation, the only unknown here is pressure. So solving for P, we end up with 237,000 pascals, which seems like a lot, that seems like a huge number, but remember atmospheric pressure is about 100,000 pascals or 10 to the fifth uh, pascals. So that is just about twice atmospheric pressure, which, which is appropriate. That isn't crazy high out of the scale that we would expect. All right, where I think it gets a little bit more confusing is if you are not given enough information to calculate directly like we did in that last example. Instead, a lot of examples that you'll see have some sort of change in them, that something gets tweaked in the system and you wanna figure out what the final property value is for a volume or pressure or temperature. So here we've got a fixed mass of an ideal gas, has a volume of 0.14 cubic meters at 301 Kelvin. If its temperature is increased to 365 Kelvin at the same pressure, What's its new volume? So we don't have enough information to actually calculate the volume because we don't know uh, how much it is. We don't know how many moles there are. We also don't know what the pressure is. We don't know what uh, that constant pressure would be in Pascals. So we actually don't have enough to calculate all of these variables, but we can identify the things that aren't changing. A fixed mass here means that N is gonna stay constant the whole time. Same, uh, in the same vein, we have the same pressure that's presented here. That means that P is gonna stay the same the whole time. And R is a constant, so R is also gonna stay the same the whole time. We're gonna rearrange this ideal gas law so that the constants get pushed to one side and these variables, uh, in this case, volume and temperature, the things that are changing are on the other side. So we do that here and we get VT is equal to NR over P. N, R, and P are always the same. We don't really need to know what that is gonna be. We don't need to know R, R, N, and P to know that that is a constant, and we don't need to know what the constant is. We just know that V over T, before and after, is always gonna give us the same number because those things in pink are never changing. So we can write an equation here with this changing part. Uh, and basically say V1 over T1 is going to be equal to V2 over T2. The initial volume is 0.14 and the initial temperature is 301. The final temperature is 365. The only thing we don't know is the new volume. So we can plug in those things that we do know. And it's basically just a ratio problem here that we're seeing how does the volume change as we increase the temperature by this much. And solving for V2 basically just multiplying both sides by 365, we get a volume of 0.17 cubic meters. So again, uh, rearrange the constants so that the things that don't change are on one side and use the variables part, the stuff that is changing, to make your relationship before and after and calculate any unknowns that you have. Let's look at another example of this. A sample of ammonia is found to occupy 0.25 liters under laboratory conditions of 27 degrees Celsius and 0.85 atmospheres. Find the volume of this sample at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. All right. We are given that we have a sample of ammonia. Um, in this case, it doesn't tell us that we're adding more ammonia or decreasing the amount of ammonia. 
So we know that n is going to remain constant the whole time. r is always a constant, so that's going to be constant there. But these other values are changing, that we are given uh, an initial volume trying to find the final volume, and an initial and final temperature and pressure here. So that means I can rearrange this formula to put my constants on one side and my variables on the other, and basically say PV over T is equal to NR, which means I don't care really how much gas there is. I know that that's always the same. So P times V over T is always going to give me the same value. Um, so I can say P1 or P1 V1 over T1 is equal to P2 V2 over T2. That this fraction is always going to give me the same number. I can set it equal. Now, looking at the units that I have here, um, if I'm going to be consistent with liters, I can keep liters. If I'm going to be consistent with atmospheres, I can keep atmospheres. But I cannot change or I cannot keep Celsius here. I have to change that into Kelvin. It must be Kelvin because that has a zero point at the molecules not moving. So I'm going to plug in what I know and change those temperatures into Kelvin. So by adding 273. One of the things that you'll notice here, if you didn't do that, you would end up dividing by zero and that would trigger a warning for you that something's wrong, um, that you're, you're probably forgetting something. So if you're ever trying to divide by zero, uh, go back and look, you're probably forgetting to convert something to Kelvin. Rearranging and solving for what I need to, that final volume, I get 0.19 liters of uh, this ammonia gas uh, in the end. Okay, finally, you should be familiar with these relationships enough that you could draw the graphs. Just remember, if the volume is increasing, if the temperature is the same, uh, the pressure must decrease because the molecules will hit the walls less frequently and not impart as much force. If the temperature is increasing, the molecules move faster, which then pushes harder on the walls, uh, so the pressure increases, and in the same way, if the temperature increases, the molecules move faster, and at the equal pressure, it uh, creates a higher volume. One final piece that I want to mention is that these constants that we've seen so far in this unit are related to each other. The gas constant, R, that we just saw, and Boltzmann constant, Kb, if you take the ratio between them, uh, so basically 8.31 divided by 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd, you're going to get a number that you probably recognize. So if I plug that into my calculator, I end up getting with 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd moles, or 1 over moles. Basically, it's Avogadro's number, Na, uh, which is a really interesting value to come out of this. And something that is important to recognize here with one of the other equations that's provided in the IB physics data booklet, we saw this one earlier, this EK bar is equal to three halves KBT, basically the equation relating the temperature in Kelvin to its average kinetic energy. Well, if you look in the data booklet, there's another part of that equality. It just says three halves R over NAT. I just want to point out that the only difference between these two is that middle term. Um, Kb and R over Na, those are equivalent constants. If you take 8.31 divided by Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, that is equal to Boltzmann's constant. Uh, and that's where that negative 20, 10 to the negative 23rd is coming from. That's why it looks familiar there. Um, that isn't random. So you don't really need these two different things because they come down to a constant. I would recommend just using this first one, three halves KBT. All right, that shows up in your data booklet um, here for that equation. And then if you need it, Avogadro's constant shows up Na um, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. All right, the takeaways of this lesson, you should be able to identify conditions when a substance is no longer considered an ideal gas. Describe the relationships between volume, temperature, and pressure in an ideal gas. Use uh, the ideal gas law to solve for pressure, volume, and temperature. Um, so basically plug and chug to solve for a given unknown. And then what we did at the very end, uh, talking about how changing one variable would affect the others, figure out what remains the same, set up your equation accordingly, uh, and then create an equation that 
basically will always equal the same thing uh, at any point in the scenario. So you can find an unknown uh, at a final condition.